I turn it over to Richard. Danny, thank you so much, and it's a delight and honor to be here. We're going to open this up uh, to any time that you'd like to ask questions. I do want to say, I, I hope you appreciate the irony. We're all up here to speak about the impact of technology. Did you see how much trouble we had putting up <laughs> uh, uh, microphones? So um, I don't know how much you'll actually learn over the next hour and 15 minutes or so, but we'll try and fake it as best as possible. And if I may, as a segue, a couple of things. You just heard Chris Matthews. Please do not let that be just 18 minutes in your life. His book, Hardball, uh, one of his, I think it's his first book, really is a remarkable read. You'll take so much away. And two, there are a couple people here. Make sure you spend some time with them. Tom Hogue in the back, who, uh, as you know, refuses to wear a tie. Certainly one of the great leaders, I think, in the industry. And the fact that he's here and has such a commitment to this institution, uh, please take advantage of him here and a very close friend. And Danny uh, Selnick, who's a dear friend of mine, as he mentioned, but incredibly well-connected and a great resource. And with that, let me open up and introduce the panel. So we start with uh, Roy Abdo over to my uh, far left. And Roy is a real hero because until 24 hours ago, he didn't know that he was going to be here. Um, right, and uh, something to talk about in group therapy. You know, I didn't uh, made it. Right. So uh, he's uh, was the Gallup, has continues to be the Gallup digital leader and the uh, co founder of his own agency, Digital uh, Revamp. To my immediate left, uh, Jack Spear, who's an anchor Hi. with uh, NPR News. I've had the great honor of listening to for at least a decade, and it's really a great pleasure to be here with you. Kevin Hall, to my far right, which I think is the only time you've ever been introduced to being to the <laughs> far right. Um, and uh, a senior uh, advisor both uh, on policy and media with Senator Mark uh, Warner, who really is, I think, the, a model for uh, senators today, trying to be both uh, bipartisan, uh, but also uh, a clear leader in the Senate. So thank you so much. Uh, and Peter Carson with the great agency, Weber Shanwick, uh, who's one of their senior directors uh, in public affairs. And Peter, it's so great to be here with you. Uh, and with that, what I'd like to do is start, if I could, Kevin, with you, and just talk about here we are in this disrupted age. How has your job changed? How has the United States Senate changed? Hmm. Um, I, I left uh, journalism to work for then Governor Warner back in 2002. Um, and it's the difference between analog then, digital now, and wholesale then, and retail now. Um, most of that a function of the technological disruption. Um, I think the world changed in 2000 when Facebook um, jumped beyond college campuses. 2006, Twitter launched. 2007, the smartphone became available. Um, and that has made um, both the news business and those of us who attempt to influence it um, a much more granular enterprise than it was even when I started um, in the a governor's press office in 2002. Um, Y'all are the first generation, I guess, that are we could call digital natives, where you've grown up online, and you can't even imagine a world that wasn't online, um, which creates a lot of challenges for those of us who predate that have tried to successfully make the, the transition from analog to digital. I presume you will tell us if we're succeeding or how we might do it better. Um, but I imagine those are some of the things we'll be talking about at some length today. Thank you. And Peter, you and I are in the same industry, working for agencies representing many clients, countries, and companies. Yeah. How has the world changed for you in the last few years? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I want to pick up on something that Chris Matthews said that I think is so incredibly important to the whole conversation and to where you all need to think about your role in communication, whether you, you go out as journalists or you're in public relations or you're working for Northrop Grumman um, or a company or organization, 
And that's the role of editors. And I, I, I'm glad that Chris talked about that. Somebody who challenged him and challenged um, the veracity of his writing. And in this day and age where everybody can be their own publisher and distributor, writer of information, that role of editing becomes critical. And so I think in our profession, where we are um, working on behalf of companies and organizations and entities, and we're working through own channels. We're not, we're not, we may not even be pitching um, a reporter. We have to be our own editors. We have to really make sure that we're, we're putting out there. We're willing to stand behind, because I'll tell you, guys like Jack Spear are going to call up and say, I'm not, I'm not buying it, what your, what your company is saying. So really, I would advise you to think about that role of editor. And, and, and what that means is you have to have a check on what you're saying. And so much of the environment that we're seeing, it's, it's just um, it's free form. Uh, and it's a little crazy. And, for, and for as, as you're, you're hearing, for many of us who, who did not, who did not, uh, were not born with all these tools, um, it's, it's, a new, it's a new world. As Chris mentioned, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, huge levels of review. Um, same with NPR, editors who are questioning and making sure that what they put out is truthful and factual. For those of us in public relations, if that's a field that you're thinking about, in many ways you have that responsibility to be good stewards of the truth on behalf of your clients. And I think, I think that becomes critical and something that's changed since the time when you and, our, when, when you and I started and, and most of what we were doing was, was to pitch the media. I think you, you and I started uh, during the teletype age, so it's nice to know here we are. Um, Roy, you, were, uh, you are and you were both a journalist and disruptor, so you've really gotten to see it from both sides. both sides. So if you could share your transition and what you've seen. Uh, well, uh, what happens is my journey with media started uh, in 2008. Uh, what happens is I... Long story short, uh, I, was, I was a student in Beirut and I went to Greece and then the war happened. And then from that, I was able to get a scholarship to go to school here. I landed in Missouri and I, and I was supposed to be there for one semester doing a scholarship for one semester. And at that point, uh, I realized, you know, I want to stay in the States and I would, I would like to basically uh, figure out a way to pay for it. And with that got me thinking, I couldn't get loans, I couldn't get scholarship to do something about it. So back in 2000. Uh, seven, you know, the blogging industry was booming and things were happening. And I've always been like a fan of digital because growing up with the internet. So at that point, I started my own blog. I wrote my story up, put a PayPal account on there, and I started emailing people my story. And with that email, I was able to raise about $35,000 online that I used to pay off my undergrad. And from that day, I realized the world we live in is changing. Whether we like it or not, technology dragging everybody down. So it's up to you to figure out how to start riding those waves and move with it. And with that, basically, the first thing, I, once I graduated, I got a job in television, and I was helping the TV transition from being this broadcaster to become this you know, interest bucket that people follow. For instance, you know, once you're on TV, you just follow everything. But once you go on the web, you want something specific to you. And then, then you go on this whole this disruption that happened in the content. The content became different on each platform. So, I kind of witnessed this transition, and it's awesome to be a practitioner in it and moving it around from one place to another, kind of like the content on different platforms. So that's my main journey. So I'm going to play Theresa May, whose microphone did work at that incredibly important uh, speech just a few weeks ago. And I'll move over to the podium. Um, and Jack, why don't you, if you would, be kind enough to share a little bit about the transition that you've seen over the last few years in this disruptive age? Um, can you hear me? Good. Yes. Um, you know, over the, I think we talked about it, Chris talked about it, we've talked about the differences in a social media mediated world. Um, certainly we have different buckets where we put news now in NPR. Yes, I'm in the broadcast part of NPR, but there are a lot of other parts of NPR now. We have a visuals unit, right? That sounds kind of strange for National Public Radio, but in fact we have a whole department of young people who are working on visuals for us now. We have online, we have a thing called NPR One. We've got a million different platforms now to work with. So this raises the, the, the big question I think that we want to talk about here today. What does this mean for you as a news consumer? And what it means is that not only do you have 
a lot of different choices within one media outlet about how you get your news. You have a lot of choices just in general about how you get your news. Mm -hmm. And it raises the issues of who do you trust, how do you determine whether in fact they've source checked their stories, are they just putting things out on blogs, how does this all work in a world when the President of the United States is issuing policy via Twitter. Uh, it, it's a real challenge to be in the journalism business right now, I'm not going to lie, it's very difficult. Um, we're all kind of trying to figure out how we sort of move into this new world. Forget going from analog to digital. Now we're just trying to figure out how we go function as a trusted news source in a world where there are myriad numbers of news sources. And you know, there's a couple different ways you as a consumer, I think, can look at this. I, I think one thing you do want to do is look at who do you think you would trust? Do you trust NPR? Do you trust the New York Times? Do you trust Huffington Post? As you go down the line, how are things sourced? Who's doing the writing for Huffington Post? What are their credentials? Who's doing the writing for NPR? Do we have editors? I do have an editor. And I think it was interesting that Chris touched on that point because that may be one thing that differentiates a serious news organization from a less serious news organization. Whether in fact you have editors, whether you have, you know, to use a really old fashioned term, gatekeepers, which I think I did my high school thesis on. Um, and that, that world has really come asunder in the last 10, 15 years. Um, in, an, in an era when anyone can be a journalist who is a journalist. And it, it's a good question. And I think it's one that all of you are going to have to ultimately be the ones who answer because we're doing it now, but we won't be in the future. And the bar will be set where you as a group of news consumers decide it should be set. So, Jack, let me ask you a question, if I may, and then please, by all means, if everyone uh, could feel free uh, to dive in. But, you know, we're calling this real news. But, of course, we've been dealing with the issue of fake news for mm -hmm. a, a period of time. Can we try and define that a little bit and see if we might be able to get any unanimity here? And I ask because I think if we all leave thinking, well, if we have an editor, we're okay. But we think about the New York Times just a decade ago who edited Judith Miller's work and it was inaccurate and we ended up with the Iraq war. So why don't you talk, if you could, uh, at least take the first stab at uh, what you view as fake news. Yeah, absolutely. And Jason Blair, too, for that example. Um, you know, fake news is not new. Everyone thinks that fake news just developed last week or last year or two years ago. In fact, fake news has been around since the dawn of journalism. In 1835, the New York Sun published a whole series about an astronomer who had supposedly found a colony of beaver-like creatures who walked upright on the moon. It's called the Great Moon Hoax. They sold a ton of papers with it. 1835. So we've, we've had fake news forever. It's not a new, a new thing. Uh, it is, however, easier to disseminate now than it's ever been because, as I said in the past, you had to have a, a platform to disseminate fake news. The Sun, New York Sun, decided to do it themselves to sell newspapers. But it's much easier now to put things out there that aren't true because the barriers to entry are so much lower. When I started out, if you wanted to get news on the air, you had to either own a radio station, have a multi-million dollar television station, or own a newspaper. That was about it. If you wanted to get news out, that's how it went out. Now anyone can put anything out there, and people do, and so it's much easier to disseminate fake news. You also have government actors who are spending a lot of time putting out fake news, propaganda, whatever you want to call it, using social media. Um, and that's not something that just the Russians do, by the way. Uh, I think we may have done it a few times, too. Um, but there's certainly a, it's just easier to do from that perspective. So, you know, I, I think fake news, I think people think they know when they see it a lot of times, but it certainly is much easier to get out there than it was when you had to own a television station, a radio station, or so. So I'm sorry to admit that Jack and I both recall when that uh, 1835 New York Sun series <laughs> right. came out. We read it in the original. Um, does anyone else want to take a stab at this? Yeah, I'll, certainly, I'll, Kevin. I'll jump in. I, th I think that the the challenge with fake news, to, to Jack's point, is it's it's a it's a relatively new term that has shown up on the on the scene. And and Jack's right. It's fake news has been around for a long time. 
I think what com compounds the problem right now is, is that the president is using it as a term for outlets with which he disagrees on the conclusion. And, and I say that as objectively as possible, wherever your politics may lie. But he simply invokes that against the media outlets who, as we were talking about earlier, are very thorough. Because I think the, the other layer that I would um, put on top of the, the definition for fake news is you're lying with intent. Um, that you are intentionally misleading people for a particular outcome. And that makes it much more dangerous uh, and in some instances uh, potentially criminal. I don't, the, the president has just decided that fake news is, is, is the opinions with which he disagrees. And I, I think, honestly, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, they all make mistakes. They are not intentionally lying, um, certainly not in their minds and certainly not in the minds of the editor. So I think that's a challenge for all of you because the, the, the question is, is the right one. What, is, what does this term mean and how is it being used? And be careful because then it just becomes a bumper sticker as opposed to having real meaning behind it. And then for all of you who are going to have to figure out how to deal with this, as, um, you know, as Chris says, we have no idea where technology and media is headed uh, in 10 years, let alone next year, you're going to have to be grappling with these issues on ethical grounds, moral grounds, guidance for your, for your clients or, or the, the journalism that you're writing. So Peter, thank you. And Kevin, do we, are we able to get this back to a, a, a more collegial Senate? I mean, we've weaponized fake news. What does that mean on the Hill and what does that mean for you both in getting your message out and dealing with uh, across the aisle? Yeah. Um, the, the news cycle has become a news cyclone. Um, and when you have two-thirds of Americans getting some or most of their news from a Facebook feed, which is dictated by an algorithm, um, which presents to you a, a fraction of what could be in your news feed based on what they think you will like because of your previous browsing history. Um, it becomes more important than ever to be a critical thinker, to um, adopt a, a, um, a sense of buyer beware with the information you're getting. Um, I'm that guy on Capitol Hill with three computer screens open at all times. One is the internet, one is email, and one is eight streams of Twitter. Um, and did I mention the four TVs on the wall? Um, <laughs> You can drown in it. Um, I think a lot of news consumers um, have decided to exist above it and not pay that close attention because the choices are so many and the volume is so overwhelming at times. Especially in the age of Trump, it feels like every hour is a day and every day is a week and every week is a month. Um, so it's, it's become tougher to critically evaluate the information you're getting. Um, if you're a student at George Mason, you're learning critical thinking skills, and that's really important. Um, equally important, though, is to break out of the silos. I mean, we talk about um, how bad gerrymandering is and how we draw election districts. We have gerrymandered news today where it's so overwhelming and so toxic at times in its tone that people stay in a safe little zone where they're only getting one version of reality um, on the right and the left. Um, and I think it's important if you're serious about journalism or responsible public relations or being a good citizen. Um, you need to be aware that at times there is a completely separate and parallel conversation going on. So you need to break out of your comfort zone from time to time and dip your toe in, if you're a progressive, watch Fox until you want to throw something at, it, at the TV. Um, <laughs> if, you're, if you're conservative, um, <clears throat> Pay attention to Rachel Maddow a couple of nights a week. Just be aware that there's a 
there's a broader conversation underway. That puts a lot of responsibility on the consumer and the purveyor of news, but I think it's, it's about the only solution I have for navigating this kind of torrent of information, some of it good, a lot of it bad.